Who's going first? Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, can you see my screen now? Yep, looks good. Okay. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. Um, while we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we each call home. From coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral lands of the people that call this land home. In particular, I like to acknowledge the traditional lands of the Dene Nation of the Lower Tanana Valley, where the UAF Trost Yeda campus is located. Um, and this is um, kind of what it looks like in Alaska today, um, maybe a little bit more snow. This was an early um, snowstorm. Um, okay, so how can we? All right. Um, we have been fortunate um, at ALA to have received um, a lot of um, NSF funding over the years. And um, we were really an early subscriber to um, digitization was in, uh, uh, at the time that was the biological research collection BRC in um, 2007. And we were one of the first herbaria was a um, smaller collection of about 190,000 specimens at the time to be fully digitized. And our early subscription to the Urbis optical character recognition process led to a number of changes in the database to show OCR output alongside the image captures and allowed us to move um, on with capturing metadata rather quickly. And uh, we've been involved um, in numerous additional, additional digitization efforts of larger semantic collection networks, such as the uh, Arctic lichens with folks at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, um, the Teridophyte TCN, um, more recently, the Bringing Asia to Digital Life with a number of institution under the leadership of um, Chuck Davis. At the University of Alaska Fairbanks, we also have a long tradition to use collections in education. And I was part of the research coordination network, AIM UP, advancing integration of museums into undergraduate programs in 2010, uh, led by Joe Cook at the University of New Mexico with other collaborators at UC Berkeley um, and uh, Harvard and UAF. And uh, recently we uh, received another um, uh, RCN UBE incubator grant um, for improving uh, data literacy and under in undergraduate students in Alaska called Alaska Datum. And more on this um, educational aspect in a later part of the talk. Um, today, I would like to talk to you about our new project entitled Taxonomically Intelligent Data Integration for a New Flora of Alaska. Um, this project has a framework for data integration based on taxon concept at its core, and the resulting new flora for Alaska will be useful in many areas of ecological outreach and research, especially related to climate change. It also includes outreach to Alaskan communities to have them collect data that will be of immediate value and where participants can see the ingestion of their records into a larger database. And that as such will engage many audiences while at the same time bolstering data collection. And I'd also like to acknowledge my collaborators on this talk, Steph Zabarik reed and uh, Dr. Cam Webb. We have an amazingly rich flora in Alaska assembled over um, millennia of plant migration between Asia and North America and in situ diversification. The characterization of this flora is hampered by particular attributes of Alaska that relate to its size, lack of broad access via the road system and few practicing botanists. Um, this results um, in a number of uh, challenges for um, doing uh, botany in Alaska. Alaska is about a fifth of the size of the lower 48s, 
um, of importance for floristic is the difficult and costly access. Um, some of our access is done um, by helicopter, um, boats, float planes, um, canoes, and um, this um, causes a lot of um, challenges. Because of these challenges, um, vast areas, oh, did it just go forward by itself? <laughs> vast areas of Alaska um, are unexplored, as you can see here in blue. Um, these are 30 kilometers poly 30 kilometer polygons, and uh, we need the help of anybody in Alaska to um, uh, get additional observations. And therefore, we are also integrating uh, iNaturalist observations into our new flora. Um, the last comprehensive flora was done by Swedish botanist Eric Holtain uh, nearly um, over 50 years ago. Uh, now, and this means that vast amounts of digital data um, and new taxonomic work that has been accomplished since uh, need to yet be integrated into a new flora. And this is a major barrier for tracking changes and distribution of native Alaskan plants and new arrivals resulting from rain shifts due to a warming climate. And there have been many taxonomic changes that have occurred as results of the flora of North America, the Panarctic flora, as well as the angiosperm phylogeny working group. And in Alaska, we're also in a particular, a peculiar situation that uh, um, we have problems here because there's um, efforts by um, Russian botanists and North American botanists that are ongoing in non-parallel fashion. And as such, um, it is important that we use um, taxonomic concepts, um, particularly in a, a situation like Alaska. So you might ask, what are taxon, what is taxon concept mapping or TCM? TCM is centered around documenting differences in taxonomic circumscription. There are several treatments for any given taxonomic group and the author of each treatment is likely to express different levels of agreement about previous treatments of each species in a genus. So a taxon concept describes the nature of agreement between different authors over time. In the case displayed here, the two authors describe an including relationship. Yurtsev on the right in taxon concept A um, describes Claytonia arctica in a way that is included in the much broader circumscription by Portzelt on the left, taxon concept B. And this is also um, depicted by the um, nested circles on the right. Other commonly encountered taxon concept relationships are congruent where both authors agree or overlapping where authors agree on a portion of the circumscription, but each circumscription also contains element not included, but in the other. Um, graduate student Kimberly Cook um, joined our project in 2020, and she learned key basics of taxonomy and botany and began taxon concept mapping for five, five key Alaskan um, plant resources, the flora of Alaska, um, Cody's flora of the Yukon Territory, the Pan-Arctic flora and Anderson's flora, as well as the flora of North America. Um, this involved recording the metadata and inferring the nature of the concept relationships, whether one of the two concepts were broader, narrower, or the same. And we'll hear a little bit more on that from uh, Cam. Um, the data was then entered into a custom database that visualizes the relationship as, as seen here. This is um, sometimes called a spaghetti diagram. And um, so far we have made pro progress on about 11 genera. And that includes um, or represents 750 taxonomic concepts and more than 650 taxon concept relationships. And the output graphs of these relationships were discussed with taxon experts who enthusiastically confirmed the accuracy of Kimberly's work. 
and we'll make these outputs available in Arctos and they'll be useful for professional tax taxonomists, but also for amateur botanists wanting to know how taxa they know from one guidebook have changed in newer guidebooks. And uh, now we'll hear a little bit more uh, details on how Arctos works with taxon concepts and other innovations from this project from the co-PI, uh, Dr. Kem Webb. Hi, I just share my screen. Uh, yeah, thanks, Steffi, for that um, introduction to taxon uh, concept mapping uh, and to the whole project. Uh, I'm just going to briefly talk about two uh, elements, uh, techie, techie elements that, um, that we're using in this larger project uh, and talk uh, about how we can actually now uh, put taxon concepts into Arctos. Um, and I put together a little um, notes document if you guys want to look at this. Um, and maybe in the chat, there's a uh, um, link. The, the link is isgood.gd slash ALA webinar. If you can just see it there. If you can get to that one, it might be in the chat too. So you can follow along. Um, so uh, as, as Steffi was saying, we put together uh, a, or made a, a little web app to help uh, with entering data uh, for taxon concepts. And for that, you need, a, you need um, basically four tables. You need a publications table, a names table, a taxon um, concept table, where you, uh, you, you link the name, uh, the, the, the name of the, the species with the publication, and then a uh, taxon concept relationship table. Uh, and so, and then entering those, um, the app then I can also draw uh, these diagrams about the relationship between different uh, ta uh, taxonomic concepts. So again, for this is uh, for the poppies in Alaska. Um, and just an example here, um, uh, Papava, Leponicum subspecies uh, occidentale, according to Haltain in his 1968 flora, uh, has a relationship um, with Papava radicatum, uh, according to Welsh in, in Welsh's um, flora, which was more recent than Haltain's. And um, uh, the relationships uh, are indicated by the different dots the different kinds of lines on this map. Uh, a, a dashed line with an arrow at the end means this concept is included in this concept. So Welsh's uh, Papava radicatum was a broader concept than um, Haltain's uh, Laponicum subspecies occidentale. And so, as, as Steffi mentioned, this is really useful for people who are trying to understand how different names have been used in different popular floras. These are, these are not specialist publications per se, but these are um, uh, major, major floras. We've got Haltain, uh, Cody for the Yukon, FNA, uh, and then the Pan-Arctic flora. Um, so uh, one, of, one of the questions then, we have this in our web app, how can we add this to another resource and how can we um, make taxon concept statements in something like Arctos? And so, Working with uh, Dusty McDonald, who, who put a lot of work into this in 2020, uh, there's now the capacity in Arctos to uh, make taxon concept statements. And I'm just going to demonstrate that in, in two ways. Uh, so uh, for, a, for a start, let's just take this um, uh, Papa, Papava Laponicum subspecies occidentale. So this is, if you should now be seeing the tab that has this Arctos record in it. Um, and this is, this is a specimen that was determined to be uh, that, uh, that species uh, by Donna de Folco uh, in 1994. And what I'm just gonna do is uh, I'm going to add a kind of a dummy additional identification to that, showing how you can now identify two attacks on concept. So if I click the identification um, link, and I hope this is still visible, even though it's a pop-up, um, the existing determination is down here below, um, and I can add a new one here. So, um, if we, uh, so we're going to do uh, it's the same, the uh, same species there. So, and we should tab that, and that should find, make sure that we've got the right one here. Um, there we go. 
uh, ID by, and that's, I put my name in there. Um, ID date is today. Nature of the ID, let's just call this a revised taxonomy. I, I'm gonna delete this afterwards, but this is just showing how we do this. Uh, confidence uh, in, in this case is, uh, is high, let's just say. Now that what, any of you who've done identifications in Arctos will know that you could always put a sensu in. So a sensu is indeed a taxon, taxonomic concept statement. So for, 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 for you know, many years, that was, um, that was sufficient. That was the same way to do what I'm about to do. What that doesn't permit you to do is then make statements about that particular concept, which I'll go on to discuss in a second. So um, uh, let's, let's then um, make this determination to a taxon concept. Um, and so I've already created one in here. Uh, and I'll just tab that. And there's a pop-up here. So I can click that. And I can create that new determination. If I close this now and then reload the um, species, we now see that there's a new determination by me uh, and it's actually to a concept. And then we can actually click on that concept and link through, for instance, to other um, taxa that have that particular concept. The concept again, here's the, so this is the, uh, the full concept string. We have the, uh, we have the species, um, the subspecies, we have the author string, and then we have a sec or sensu, and this, this is uh, a two Hultane 1968. So again, this, this is stating that uh, uh, if this was actually, if I was doing this for myself, it would be, a, uh, I was using Hultane's concept uh, in the 1968 flora um, for this identification. So the next thing is to show how we add uh, those concepts to Arctos. So what I pulled up again is um, if we go back to the original um, diagram here, uh, P. Leponicum has an overlapping relationship. That's what this dash, this dash line means with the pan-Arctic flora concept of P. Hultanii. So I thought I would add that and just show you how we, we would link those two together. So here's uh, Papaba Hultanii. Currently, it doesn't have any concepts in it. If you scroll down, it, uh, it doesn't have any, but you can click on manage concepts here. And uh, first of all, let's pick a publication. So this one is, we're gonna say this is the PAF um, uh, of 2011 uh, Pan-Arctic Flora. That's the short code for that. Uh, the second one, the second one is the, uh, uh, the author taxon author string. Uh, it's already set up there. I just click on Knabin that gets added. And then if I hit generate a label um, with this, brown button, it puts in a nice uh, suitable uh, label, including uh, HTML tags to make this um, uh, italic. So we've got Papava, Hotenii, Cannabin, Sensu. I could also edit, edit this and make sec. It means the same thing, uh, PAF 2011. So if we, if we click on create now, and then we go back to um, the, uh, the page for this, we now, if we scroll down, we now see that there is a concept for a particular concept for this name, Papaba Holtenia Cannabin Sensu PAF 2010. It also has a very nice uh, permalink. Um, so uh, you can see up here, this is now a, a GUID for that concept, should you ever want to um, uh, put anything else, connect anything else to it. So let's go back to uh, manage concepts again, and let's make a uh, relationship statement between two concepts. So again, what we're going to do is going back to this, we're going to model or add the relationship, the overlapping relationship between P. Hultenii sec PAF and P. Laponicum uh, subspecies ex occidentalu, occidentalis sec or sensu Hultane. And the overlap relationship means that they're not exactly the same. That's what we call, we call that congruent. Um, but there are some uh, overlapping uh, members. Um, within them. Uh, so going back here again, uh, we're going to, well, first of all, we have to pick in a publication. Um, and what I, I created was a publication that uh, it's a, it's a former publication uh, of um, Kimberly Cook's work. Uh, so it's, it was called here, Cook uh, 2021, and just tab that. And yep, I found it. And so the relationship here we, we choose overlaps with, and then it's another 
papaver, it's that first one. We hit papaver here. Here we go. So it's papaver laponicum, subspecies occidentally. Um, uh, Sec, Haltain, 1968. So we create that. And finally, we go back to Papaver again here. And um, uh, if we go down to the concepts, so we have Papaver Haltania, Cannabin Sensu PAF 2011, has a relationship, overlaps with Papaver Laponicum subspecies Occidentale, Sec, Haltain. So now we, we can put uh, all this taxon concept mapping information into uh, Arctos. Um, and anyone now who's making an, uh, an identification can actually link to a particular usage of the name. Uh, and we you know, strongly encourage people to do this. Um, at the moment, there's no bulk, it's no, no way to bulk uh, upload, but um, hopefully we'll work with uh, Dusty so that uh, all, all the data that comes out of our taxon mapping app will be able to be um, linked up. Uh, linked straight in without ha having to add them one by one. Uh, and then I should say there's also, um, there's, a, there's more information in the, um, uh, in the handbook, in the Arctos handbook. If, uh, you can click on this link if you have this document, um, how to manage taxon concepts in Arctos. The, uh, the second part of what I want to talk about is uh, data in, Arct in Arctos and getting data out. And as you can imagine, um, uh, for our flora, we'd like to incorporate data. We'd like to incorporate specimen information, um, taxonomy information into um, our new uh, developing new flora of Alaska. Uh, and so um, we somehow we, we we can't we don't want to just go through the uh, the main uh, um, interface and, and and click on on hundreds of species. And even if we can download as a group. It's, it's easier to get the information out from sort of under the hood, so to speak. And so we use what's called the API, the Application Programming Interface. Um, and uh, Dusty, again, uh, earlier this year, put together a new API, which is uh, documented also in the handbook. You can click on this link, the Arctos API um, in the handbook. And um, so you, the the API could be queried. This is it, it's it's a it's a basically a plugin or a uh, a plug tool for other computer programs and 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 researchers to uh, to plug into. So it could be queried live um, by another program that wanted to go and get information, say about a specimen. It would it would it would need the um, uh, GUID and just go in, query it, get it up, and display that new data. Um, Optus, as you know, runs a little slowly, so sometimes that's not going to be appropriate. So you can also download information uh, and then cache it. So the, the endpoint for the uh, API is just is a, um, a string here. It's arctos.database.museum slash component slash API, and then some other bits at the end. And if you, if you go to the link below here, um, and this is method about, it actually, um, you don't need a key to see uh, what comes back from that API. So that's that URL. I pasted it in this browser and you see it's, it's kind of looks a bit gobbledygook here. This is a serialization of data called JSON, uh, J-S-O-N, JavaScript object notation. If you're using Firefox, Firefox will very kindly make that JSON um, uh, much more readable because J uh, JSON is a hierarchical data structure. And so this is what that, um, uh, that raw data looks like. Um, and this this will tell you about all the different um, queries that you can put into Arctos. Um, uh, you can query any of these um, uh, fields here. And so um, you form a, uh, a query by uh, pasting some additional search keys. So for instance, genus equals papaver and species equals haltanii onto the end of this um, this string here. Now, the um, because it's very powerful and can run a lot of queries, uh, uh, access is limited, and you need what's called an API key. So, any of you who um, have access uh, to Arctos and um, make a request uh, will be given an API key that you can then use to run this API. You can't make queries to the API without the API key. Uh, and so, for instance, if I uh, again, query the um, API with um, genus equals papaba 
and um, species equals Haltanii, this is the data that comes back. So again, this is the raw, this is the raw data in, um, in JSON format, and this is the cleaned up version. And what you see is we have, um, first of all, some headers. There was totally a total record count of 62 came back. Um, and these were the query columns that came back. You can, add, you can ask for additional information. And this is very useful, uh, particularly, uh, we use this a lot to get the barcode information out, which is in a, um, a field called parts date, part detail. And uh, it's, there's no other way to get that out in a, in a large fashion other than through the API. Um, and then, so there's, uh, there's uh, a maximum of 10 records. Default, you can increase the, the page size. Uh, and so here are the, here are the uh, GUID, the scientific name, and all this information here, including along the lab. Um, so uh, just then finally to, uh, oh, and I, I should also mention that um, uh, you can get a lot of data out of Arctos via the API, um, but it is, it is still obviously, uh, you've got to program that, it takes a bit of time. If you do want a large data dump uh, from Arctos, um, the simplest place to go is the GBIF IPT, uh, Integrated Publishing Toolkit dumps that, um, that are made by Vertnet. So there's a link here, and uh, this is the Vertnet resource, and uh, you, uh, the, the latest one was um, published on the 10th, uh, the 25th of October. So they, they're, they, they're monthly, monthly dumps, and they can contain, uh, in this case, for ALA, uh, 200,000 records. Uh, in a, uh, it's in a Darwin Core archive, but you can unzip that, and it's basically a CSV file. And there's 94 fields for each record, and those, those may be sufficient for, for your needs. If they're not, then you do need to go through the, the API. So I thought I'd, I'd, I'd finish up by showing just a quick uh, demo. Um, oh, I, one, one other thing I was forgetting here. Uh, licenses, I do remember if you're using data um, from an API of any kind, um, it's really important to make sure that the license uh, is, permits you to do that. And so the Arctos ALA data is, is shared under a, a Creative Commons license uh, by, which means attribution and non-commercial non use. So attribution must be made uh, for, for these data. So a final um, uh, demonstration of how we can take information, say, out of Arctos and mesh it up with other things it's just a, a, this is a, a bit of a dummy uh, quick app I just put together for this purpose. Um, the link is down at the bottom here on this page. It's, uh, it's um, uh, Alaska Flora, which is our main website, and then um, slash QM for quick map. So uh, for instance, in this case, uh, what, what this contains is it contains all the records from uh, Arctos and also um, the Alaskan records from iNaturalist uh, and also the Haltane dot maps that we digitized in the uh, that we've obtained by digitizing Haltane. So if we if we put in uh, a power there, um, and you, you, this is out there, you can anyone can use this. Um, you can see that um, these are the Arctos records, uh, and then where there's a yes here, there's also the same name occurs um, in um, iNaturalist. So in this case, let's let's just click on Papa uh, and it should run, hopefully. It's all a bit slow here. Um, there we go. And um, so here's, here's just a simple map. And uh, you can click on and off the different dots. This Arctos is in red, Inactus is in yellow, and Haltane is in blue. Um, and the, um, the Arctos, the red ones, have links to um, their, their reference in uh, Arctos. And the Inat uh, records also have links to their Inactus record. So it's just a, a quick demonstration of how having access to the data through the API enables us to do all sorts of fun downstreams uh, stuff with it. So I'm going to wrap up and I'm going to pass on to Steph. And we thought um, we would just end here with a Russian specimen. Um, so uh, this is um, Papapa uh, Shezkanowski. Um, and we actually have to go to the other side of the world to get the Russian specimen. Here we go. So here are some specimens, and we can see that back in Arctos. 
and Steph will take it from here. Thank you very much, and I'll stop screen sharing. Thank you, Cam. And I will start screen sharing just as soon as there we go. Can you see that? My screen? Yes, yep, looks great. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, so here, here are the records of uh, Abavar uh, Shekhanowski uh, as they appear on my screen in Arctis. Same map, same location, same data and whatnot. So um, what I do in Arctos is mostly digitized herbarium sheets as well as search and update records as a super user. So I'm going to demonstrate some of the power and flexibility built into Arctos based on my experiences on the front end. So one of my favorite um, searches is by taxon. Uh, this will return all the specimens for that taxon. Um, and when it's done, it will also show a map there they are, that one, of each record as it was collected, provided it's been georeferenced in Arctos. Nice thing about this is I can click on any of these points and pull up that uh, locations ta uh, taxon, all of the taxon collected in that location, um, in that area. Searching by locality, it's really handy because it returns all the specimens for the locality as they are entered into the database, which can have many applications uh, for georeferencing, ecological conservation, and sustainability. If I go back into the taxon and click on the points, as you can see, it will return the search results for every specimen collected. I can also search by the accession number, the barcode, loan number, catalog number. It's, there we are. Where are we? There we are, catalog number and many, many other fields. Um, what I've done most as a super user, let me go ahead and open this up. What I've done most as a super user is update records um, by locality and then geo-reference them so that you can get this map of the taxon. When I do this, what I try to do is record the verbatim locality exactly as it's presented on their barium sheet, typos and all in whatever alphabet it's presented in. This is actually one of the coolest things about Arctos. The system accepts locality information using many different alphabet types. This preserves the data from the herbarium sheet as it was recorded. When I update records, I can use the character specific to the language on the herbarium sheet. I can put, then put a translation into English into another field. And let me show you what that means. So in locality, I have what's called the verbatim location. That's, this is exactly as it appears on the herbarium sheet. Then I have another field called specific locality, which I can embellish. I can spell it out. I can put in uh, translations, whatever. Um, I've lost my... Looking again. The reason I do this is because of the georeference tool. That tool is based, georeference on geolocate is based in English. It can tie in to the uh, specific locality to try to shortcut where a record may actually be located, which is right here. That's actually uh, the Sheep Mountain on Glen, on Glen Highway, Milestone 113. It's this flexibility. Um, by putting two, the two locality fields in uh, languages that allows us to widen our search, to broaden our search. Um, and the reason this is handy comes when we start working with the Russian records and some of the records that are recorded in something besides English. Uh, this is a search on Tuva in the former Soviet Union. This is the same search in Cyrillic. I can actually put both records, both searches in Arctos and run them. 
And because I've got everything set up in Cyrillic on the verbatim locality and in English on the specific locality, I will find, oops, wrong one, I will find both records. That's actually quite powerful. Um, it means that it, whoever has, you know, when you pull up the records that you need, you have many means to, at your disposal to do so. You'll get more accurate data and you'll get as much data as possible, all while preserving the historical record found in the herbarium sheet. Um, I'm unsure if this works with Asian language platforms as I'm not proficient in DBCS characters and I haven't been able to try it. It does work as you can see with Cyrillic and Latin character sets though. Here is a record from Norway. I'm actually able to uh, use some of the special characters that would be found in some of the Scandinavian languages. I can do this with French. Um, I can do this all over the place. It's really kind of handy. Um, because change is inevitable and the older record, uh, record is, the more likely something about it will have changed that will impact your search query. Um, like this record in, Dan in Danish, this also makes it a lot easier to find older records if you've got, you know, if you've got things mixed like this verbatim locality and specific locality. Um, the reason, part of the reason this can be important is things do change. The terminus of the Mendenhall Glacier in 1918 is not the same spot as the terminus in the Mendenhall Glacier in 2021. So if you pull up the term, uh, records for the terminus of the Mendenhall Glacier and don't bear the historical record into mind, you're going to get a wide area for your, for your results. And you're going to see that on the map. You're going to see things that may have moved for, uh, across the way. And that's to be expected. Uh, also, Cities often get renamed and occasionally named back. St. Petersburg in Russia, for instance, was named Petrograd at one point after the 1918 revolution. Then after Glasnost, it was renamed back to, to St. Petersburg. The actual look, collection locality didn't change, but the name did. So don't be afraid to get creative in your search queries. Now, I'd like to mention two projects that are on our radar. Having the ability to use Cyrillic in Arctis is really important to a project for the hidden special collections and archives of the Council of the Library and Information Resources. This is a collaborative effort between the University of Washington, the Western Washington University, and the ALA, focusing on creating online access to vascular plant specimens from the Russian Far East. Uh, ALA's portion encompasses about 6,000 Russian label specimens, which will be translated into English digitized and geo-referenced. So having the ability to use Cyrillic is really important for that effort. UAF is also involved in a collaborative research project called Bringing Asia to Digital Life. This aims to make underrepresented Asian herbarium collections in the US available in order to propel biodiversity and discovery. Um, the All Asia uh, TCN features Asian herbarium collections in the US. The project focuses on digitizing millions of specimens from across Asia, especially those from unique and critically endangered biodiversity hotspots in Southeast Asia and the Himalayan Huangdan region of China. ALA's, uh, ALA will be working on about 10,000 vascular plant specimens for this TCN. Of these, about 6,600 will need to be input into the database and geo and about 10,000 herbarium sheets will be digitized and attached to their specimens. It's a really big project and really it's a very exciting one as well. And with that, I will turn the presentation back over to Steffi and thank you. All right, um, we're gonna go back to the PowerPoint. All right, can you see the PowerPoint? Yep. Yes. <laughs> so um, the University of Alaska stands as a model in Arctic regions, exemplifying how public natural history collections can be utilized to create active place-based learning experiences with the aim of increasing engagement in STEM literacy and building connections between museums and communities. And uh, here at the Herbarium, we've been engaged in several of these um, approaches. And uh, on the left, you can see a couple of the DOIs for some of the papers um, that resulted from these efforts. 
And uh, these efforts take many forms, including the development of teaching materials um, involving physical objects and or online data from Arctos, training pre-service teachers and implementing citizen science projects. And um, I'd like to wrap this talk up with a few examples of some innovative uses of specimen images from Arctos in support of teaching systematic botany here at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. So I teach a um, systematic botany course, um, Biology 331, and we've developed um, online um, virtual dissection videos for the students um, to take um, to view. And so they get a little bit of the uh, experience with um, dissection, what that would look like, and then they do their own dissections at home. So students do not just sit at their computers in this class, they go outside, collect plants, dissect them and share them and what they discover with others. And the virtual classroom also includes um, learning glass videos. If you're not familiar with, I can let you um, see some of those later. And then in, uh, uh, during COVID, I also had to migrate my face-to-face -face biology 331 systematic botany to the online environment. And that's a heavily specimen-based class with two labs per week. And so I was pondering how I could create a somewhat hands-on activity for this class. And for that, I created a um, virtual herbarium tour in um, ThingLink. And we're gonna try to um, go to that now so that links out to that page. And um, you can create a virtual tour, which hopefully um, will load. So here it is. And um, you're able to um, annotate uh, things. You can see here the creators or um, here you can, uh, it links out to Arctos. The student gets kind of, get kind of an overview of the latest uh, green plant phylogeny um, that they can also um, get to the paper with this link out. But more importantly, um, they can link out to specimen cabinets um, and here is kind of, again, uh, reiterating the phylogeny of uh, APG3, and then it links to a herbarium cabinet, and in these herbarium cabinets, um, the students can then explore um, particular specimens that are from Arctos. Um, we have some information about ethnobotanical uses of um, fireweed seen here. Um, they can look at um, descriptions of the leaves, um, uh, habitat information of uh, fireweed and it's um, where its namesake comes from, um, uh, early pioneer species, and uh, additional um, morphological features that they can um, look at with um, uh, linked images. And then um, even you can link additional um, papers for them to read, and then they can click even off on the link out image. So it's kind of a, a really um, nice um, resource that we built. And um, so I have to get out of here. And as you can see, it, it, it goes through um, many of the different um, taxa. And then what is really uh, neat is that, as you know, or anybody that teaches systematic botany, you always have kind of um, a quiz section where you give them unidentified plant material. How are you gonna achieve that in the online environment? And so we created a quiz cabinet and there are um, seven specimens per week that they have to um, look at and identify. So we click on specimen one here for week one. This is the specimen, you notice there's no label here. They get some information on what this plant, um, where it would be found, some detailed photography that we did on the pressed herbarium uh, specimens, um, looking at flowers, uh, the stamen features, um, some more details on the connectives of the stamens, and then um, also something on the color that might not be as uh, visible on this dried herbarium specimen. And uh, so the students can then, um, based on this information on the Canvas website, um, they have um, links to these specimens here. And they can also, um, in, for each specimen, it then gives them also resources whether to use the Holtain's flora or the flora of North America. And then um, they identify the specimens that way. And um, 
students have been really excited about um, using this uh, virtual medium for the class. And uh, so then we go one more. So um, again, Act Arctos has been um, instrumental in all of these efforts and they, it has supported and enhanced um, these efforts and we're excited to continue building functionalities that both enhance curation, research and education and outreach. And we see the latest investment by NSF into Arctos as a capstone synthesis of prior NSF investment in the physical and data infrastructure and in the personnel using this fantastic resource. And I thank you all for listening and we're happy to answer questions you might have in uh, getting into Arctos or any other questions. Thanks. Oops, so we can get out of this. There we go. You're still muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was gonna say, thank you so much. Um, that was just truly wonderful. I think we're all very impressed um, by all the amazing work you all have been up to. Um, yeah, as Stephanie said, we'll open it up for questions. Um, feel free to unmute or type in the chat if you have any questions. See a lot of comments on how great that is for virtual learning. Um, yeah, we were I was chatting with someone, we were talking about um, the taxonomic concepts could be a great uh, intern project and we do have Arctos interns. So <laughs> making all those relationships would be quick work. Yeah, I mean, one little note from that is uh, uh, Kimberly Cook, who did an amazing job um, with the Alaska flora, what, what didn't come into that, you know, that job as a taxonomist and so, uh, it, it is something that interns can be um, uh, can engage in, uh, you know, without any any background. In, I, I, you need to be good at logic and inference and reading, but uh, that, it's the detail skills. Um, anyone can do that. So there's a question: If we've worked with Alan on this. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we, um, I mean, we, we had meetings with Alan, um, and uh, I, yeah, I, yeah. So I, and we've obviously very much modeled our, our whole approach and what we could do in a flora based on what he did for the uh, uh, the southeast flora. So um, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, There's another question by um, Lucia Lohman, If Arctos has been used by other collections in the U.S. And how easy would it be to connect among collections? So um, I'm not too familiar um, of how many there are. There are other herbarium collections in the US that are using Arctos. Um, I got my degree at um, Arizona State University. So that's the flagship Symbiota um, uh, development um, portal, so to speak. and. Um, it's been interesting to watch that um, a lot of the TCNs are promoting um, Symbiota. So it's, um, I'm not sure why. Um, I have to say that, you know, I've, when I was there, I, I liked working with Symbiota, but I'm really um, impressed and um, uh, impressed by Arctos and the, you know, the real um, intimate relationship we have with the developers, with the, which are biologists in our case and not just um, um, software folks that that really allows us to make some really amazing um, changes and accommodate really unique collections. We have historical um, natural, um, sorry, ethnology collections, art collections that are served um, by Arctos, which are, have very different requirements than the natural history collections and um, the development team is just amazingly um, flexible in, in accommodating the different needs of these collections. Looks like there's a question from um, Rich about uh, oh, 
how is Cyrillic to English translation accomplished? I read and write Russian. I speak it a little bit too as a child. Yeah, so we got um, we got that funding um, from both NSF and then the hidden collections um, funding, and that will um, will hire additional um, people that can translate the Russian um, labels for us and enter the data into Arctos. Brett, I see there's a you have your hand up. Sure. Hey, everybody. <clears throat> I was wondering for the particularly for the All Asia grant, um, we were thinking about these different, you know, alphabets. And if there was some way, maybe not translating them, but going through bulk sets of images to say, hey, these are all Cyrillic, these are all this, these are all that. And then, and, and then at least they would be in piles of lang, you know, different languages that people could look at. And then we could do notes for nature expeditions based on the language instead of how notes for nature are normally done with, you know, a taxon, like a family or a, these are things from this country or, you know, particular state. I don't know if people have talked about that yet, but if there was some sort of automatic recognition and then it flagged it as a certain set of characters, that might be really useful for the, all, particularly for the all Asia thing, but maybe past that. Yeah, no, it sounds like a great idea. I, I imagine the uh, AI machine learning tools that they're hopefully you know, going to roll up some of the label transcription will include a recognized language component so that 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 should give a you know an output field as as to language but uh yeah that sounds good any last questions before we wrap up Looks like, are there ways to use the API to translate the user interface? Um, you could, yeah, I, I think you could build a, a whole separate stack, uh, a, a web app that would just, yeah, it would, it would uh, the, you know, the, the search fields would be in another language. Uh, it, it probably wouldn't be as complicated as the Arctos search page, but you could definitely make a um, another app that would then send a, a request to the through the API and get back uh, the data and display it. So yeah, I mean this is the whole thing with an API. You can build you can build anything on top of it, um, uh, and and something like that could be doing live queries too. So uh, yeah, that would be great. Anyone anyone want to go for it? <laughs> Well, great. I just want to say a big thanks to all of our presenters. That was really excellent. Um, we have recorded this webinar, so it will be available shortly on our YouTube. And um, we hope to see you all next month, December 14th. Thanks again. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Emily. Thanks for hosting. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.